thank the organizers, uh, Casa Arabe, for giving us the opportunity of uh, being together and uh, for this session that will be on water in the Mediterranean. As you know, it is a very precious resource and it is uh, there is a short, an increasing shortage of it, not only because it is uh, raining less often, but also uh, but this average of water does not m mean anything because sometimes it rains in a very short period of time in very limited uh, reg uh, regions. And then there is drought uh, more and more often. So we have to, we need a debate uh, as, as uh, extend as possible with the society and the participants today. Uh, we will uh, cast some light on the debate which is necessary uh, for the uh, water demand and also for the offer that has to change. It is a, a big cultural change we need in the region, in the Mediterranean region. And I am sure that uh, these experts that are more experts than I am because I am just a manager, but they are really specialists. And I would like uh, to present, to introduce them to you, you will have the uh, privilege of listening to them and, and uh, really to uh, see. So I would like to uh, introduce Ramiro Martinez, co general coordinator of uh, the Mediterranean uh, work of, of basing of organizations, the coordinator of uh, 5 plus 5, uh, water 5 plus 5, for the Western Mediterranean. We have also Alain Maisonnier, the president, uh, the president of the Mediterranean Institute for Water, and we have also Marwa Wesleti, who is uh, responsible for the the project manager for the Euro Mediterranean Information System on the uh, water sector, and finally we will have. Um, Francisco Pedrero is a senior researcher and is, he's going to present uh, today uh, the network for young Mediterraneans for water. Uh, so in this debate, we the, the fact that we had the, the youth in this debate, I think, is essential because it will be uh, their turn to manage this uh, very, very serious problem. Um, so they will have to manage this problem. So I think it is a very important prospect. So um, um, I, I'm not going. I I would like to take the floor just to frame the debate, and we will have some questions. I will have. I'm going to read some. The state of the availability of water resources in the Western Mediterranean. Which countries' regions are more threatened by shortages? La deuxième, c'est what should be the priorities of a more integrated management of the resource? What are the obstacles? La troisième, what are the key reforms and priority measures to be implemented for an optimal and sustainable management of the resource? How can the most water demanding sectors, including uh, urban use, tourism, agriculture, industry be better managed in this regard and whether there are best practices. How can participation of local populations in the improvement of water management be supported and strengthened? Ça, c'est le débat social dont je parlais tout à l'heure. I was talking about uh, and could the water uh, systems in the Western Mediterranean lead to a strengthening of the water management capacities of the countries of the region. Moi-même, je suis Octavi Quintana, je, je suis le directeur d'une fondation Prima qui, uh, en fait, fin A foundation, and we finance uh, projects, water projects, agriculture and food in the region. And we finance uh, some calls, uh, some uh, 10, million, uh, 10 million a year. We are uh, 
the countries, uh, there are 19 countries around the Mediterranean basin, plus uh, Germany, who is uh, always present, um, even if they are not very Mediterranean. But, they, but, but uh, when there are uh, European funds, Germany is always participating. For us, the most important thing in, our, in all our projects is to as uh, uh, to have a sec not an as a sectorial approach but an intersectorial approach that means the most comprehensive approach as possible uh, we are very interested in our projects to, to really uh, to try to have the the mo the vision the most comprehensive vision as possible of this the biggest scope of the problem and especially the water management so ramiro uh, uh, i give you the floor ramiro merci octavio thank you octavio good morning Everybody, I am really delighted to be with you again, to see you again after the pandemic and, and to see your faces, even if it is uh, just uh, <laughs> briefly. As Octavio said, I am Ramiro Martinez. I represent the Mediterranean network of uh, the basin organisms. We are a regional uh, network. We have the main objectives is uh, the promotion of the uh, resource uh, management. And at the uh, regional level in the Mediterranean, uh, see, we are the technical secretariat of the process. Uh, in the in dialogue five plus five. Uh, before I would like to say what is the situation in the general panorama, it is clear that Lagir it's uh, um, need before a planning uh, to 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 have a planning based on the governance uh, that needs the training of all the players participating in this governance scheme, and finally, as you know. Uh, these uh, integrated management, uh, it is uh, within the objectives of the sustainable objectives of the uh, United Nations. It is um, uh, in the objective 615. Uh, so in this session, I will show you some some uh, figures, a chart about the situation at the Mediterranean level. And so key as regards of the res resources exploitation, you can see on the left, the situation, the situations really severe in Syria, Malta, Israel, Egypt, Libya, where the exploitation is above the unity that is uh, that every year they, util they use more water that it can be uh, renewed in a natural way, this water. This is the situation. So we can translate this situation also at the uh, available resources per habitant and per year. And we can see also that uh, we have problems, very serious problems in Algeria, Egypt, and Palestine, and uh, etc. As a key uh, for as regard for the the demand in the water sector, you know very well. Uh, uh, at the bottom on right, it is agriculture, is a very demanded sector, with nearly eighty percent of demand is in terms of quantity. Another things in terms of guarantee, uh, as you know, uh, the main demand of guarantee is is uh, from the population. What uh, how, what do you do to face this problem? Usually, we have uh, organized a, st uh, a stock of water in Spain. We are uh, the champions in, in, in big uh, uh, barrage, barrage. is the country where we have a lot of reservoirs to face these, uh, these um, challenge. But this process is, is being developing, uh, developed in, in the, the rest of the Mediterranean. But in uh, Turkey, they are building big reservoirs. 
uh, as an additional date uh, it is in Spain we have uh, uh, one something like uh, uh, one billion uh, uh, barrage one really of dams and so uh, just to make live four or, or five million inhabitants instead of the 45 million inhabitants today in Spain. We can uh, have a different definitions of the, expl the, the, the management of the resources. Oh, here you have the definition of the global water partnership, but instead of that, I, I have chosen is what is, uh, in our opinion, what are the main uh, um, opinions, challenges, issues um, that should appear in the integrated management of the Medi Western Mediterranean. First of all, it is the scarcity of water, because in our region, in the Mediterranean, we don't have a lot of resources, because in general it's a very dry region. So this scarcity of water is becoming a shortage, a shortage of, of water. That means that we are lacking water to face the demand for the different uses is a big problem that is has been a by the climate change and all the uh, forecasting that we are going to reduce more and more uh, these quantities of water. So that means that what we really have to stock water, as, as we say, with reservoirs, dams, or other systems, and especially uh, works of assigning water. Because if there are not uh, water for all the uses, we have to do some work and to choose water, what is going to be the distribution of the water available and this is a key question in the integrated uh, use, uh, management of these resources because it's not a very abundant resource in our region uh, when we speak speak about resources, we talk about conventional and non-conventional resources. Of course, every time uh, uh, the word non-conventional has to be maybe a little bit modified, changed, because uh, how can we say that desalination is a non-conventional, uh, that we have used that uh, uh, quite conventional. We've been doing uh, that for um, uh, 60 years. This uh, need of the uh, as, uh, as assigning the water that, that poses, that uh, causes a conflict among the users uh, because, well, uh, sometimes there are conflicts between uh, agriculture and the rest of users namely the population so in this so we have to uh, choose to make it a, a, to a choice uh, in this uh, assignment of water we have to gather the authorities and to get to an agreement for this distribution and and also uh, the word uh, integrated is really crucial. We have he heard in the uh, recent years, we have, we have heard the word nexus uh, for agriculture, environment, etc. But for us, when we talk about, it is a, uh, is a partial vision. For us, the only vision, possible vision, is the integrated vision with all the sectors concerned, included. But not only uh, the concerning the, the resource quantity, but also the, proct the protection that we have to offer to all countries. And also the integrated uh, uh, management is uh, in the basin for us, at the basin level. It is the territory where uh, the natural phenomena are taking place, and uh, it is the the framework, the most appropriate frame, uh, framework to evaluate the resources and their uses. And in this situation, 
the word basin is um, not only in a hydrological uh, definition, we have uh, to add also other definitions, the aquifers, and to define the basin, uh, uh, mixing different definitions, the basin uh, in the surface and the subterranean basin. basin. Uh, this is included in the objectives of the sustainable development, as we have seen. This is uh, the, uh, the world level, uh, the integrated uh, water uh, um, management is the uh, re 2008 report. But there are plenty of things to do still everywhere. And there is, an, in, in our region, this is our situation. There are countries, especially in the north, uh, in Europe, but not all, only that they have put in place the integrated management, but there are plenty of things to do. And there are more advanced people like Tunisia and Morocco that have put in place this integrated management, but we have to do plenty of things in the rest of the countries. We have taken into account all these phenomena and we had set up the strategy for the Western Mediterranean water management. Uh, in the 2015. In this uh, strategy, uh, we need a consensus in, uh, among the 10 countries of the uh, Western Mediterranean. We have three blocks of priority. The first is the uh, sustainable policy for water, um, which is translated in the action plan in, in approved in Marrakesh in 2016. In different uh, uh, sections proposed, namely the sections three and four, uh, that uh, are aimed at the uh, training and, and experience, uh, sharing experience among the different countries. So I can announce that in 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 a few in a few months there will be a new water conference in the framework of five plus five, and the main topic will be the approval of a training uh, plan for the countries. And I would like to stress concerning um, this plan, the things, concerning the things we debated yesterday, that for us, the Water 5 plus 5, we have seen just the fact of to gather the countries around the a table and uh, to, to talk about the same things and to get to an agreement is, is a big exercise of exchange of, uh, of experiences and uh, knowledge. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Ramiro. Thank you so much, Ramiro, for your uh, presentation and to announce us what uh, you are going to do in the future in this conference of 5 plus 5. I would like to invite Alain. Alain, do you have a presentation? OK, go ahead. Thank you. Th bo uh, good morning, everybody, to all I haven't seen this morning. The uh, uh, med of, for having invited us uh, to this meeting. And uh, uh, 5 plus 5 is very interesting since yesterday. Thank you, Ramiro, for having built this framework, which is uh, the water management. I'm going to try to uh, answer these questions, these five questions, because we have uh, to be in the in the framework. So we have to know that. Um, uh, well, I just shout that water is in danger, is jeopardized in the Mediterranean. So, if we don't do anything today, we really we will be a situation where COVID-19 is nothing compared of the things that are awaiting us. So, in terms of pedagogy, we we have to communicate, and you have to be better in communication, as we have seen. This is an important point. So, only uh, salted uh, water water and, f and uh, fresh water are in danger. Our sea, our uh, Mare Nostrum is a concentrated of waste and plastic that we are dumping permanently into the, uh, to the water. For the fresh water, um, it is in danger for the fact that uh, the double effect of the hot spots, the hydric um, um, stress, that is not in the same uh, sense, it goes to the negative sense, 
year after year. And also, it is accelerated by the climate change, as it has been stressed several times. And this, once again, uh, is, is being confirmed every year. So uh, this is the half-empty glass. But, but on the other hand, there are know-how, there are uh, skills. And there is a, a Mediterranean Water Forum that will take place next year in Germany, where the responses to face these challenges, we are going to try to bring answers uh, to choose some of them uh, that will be in the World world uh, um, Forum uh, that will take place in 2022 in Dakar. So there are solutions, but we have to put them in motion and share them with our partners. But of course, it is the southern and eastern countries of the Mediterranean that are the most threatened, uh, both by, by democracy uh, which is the good, evil, more important concerning water. When I was born, we were uh, uh, under 3 billion inhabitants on the planet. Now we are near 8 billion. So in, uh, in um, 60 years time, can you imagine? Uh, so uh, we have more than double the world population and the Mediterranean is not an exception. Also, we have a specific phenomenon. It has it was pointed uh, pointed uh, out yesterday. Five hundred million uh, inhabitants and more than three hundred tourists every year. So that is a negative effect of the of the demand on water because you know that the tourists. Uh, cons uh, con the consumption of tourists is between uh, five and ten times more water uh, than a, a non-tourist uh, person usually. So th that we have to convey these figures in our communication because the tourists should uh, use the same quantity of water that they use at home. So nobody is uh, protected from uh, shortages, even in France. Uh, Last year, uh, 70 departments in France had a threat of drought, and, and there, uh, there are departments, regions where usually it rains, like uh, in France, for example, Vendée, which is the first department in France uh, that has the first project of reusing a wasted uh, water. is is not Mediterranean, it's in oh, Vendée, so everybody is affected by this phenomenon. So. Another aspect very interesting is uh, the World Bank uh, uh, issued a report last September, and I, I would encourage you to have a look at it uh, about the migration in Mediterranean, no, uh, namely in the Maghreb and Middle East, uh, the migration in the countries of origin, and it is. Uh, it is the consequence of the climate change. So this trend is going to be accelerated. That means that the countries concerned must have a vision, not a, a, a five, 15 year vision, or no, but 30 or 40 years ahead. So the cooperation uh, must be strengthened once again through the implementation of exchange platforms as the Mediterranean Institute for Water that was created 40 years ago and who gathered at the same time uh, the collectivity, ministries, the, the actors, the enterprises, uh, public and private for water, and the experts. It is the only organism that allow all the countries, all these different population, uh, the politicians, the decision makers, uh, the actors uh, that we don't speak a lot, but thank uh, COVID-19 we have uh, spoken a little bit more because they ensure the service of water during the COVID-19 as, for example, the waste, the trash, and they were part of these teams that they had to be working permanently. And then the experts all around throughout the Mediterranean. So NGOs too, uh, an NGO that is based in Marseille. So organisms like, like uh, um, Blue Time, uh, the Observatory in Sahel, Sahara, and many others, 
should work in partnership with the, the members of the uh, uh, INEM in because they have the vocation to coordinate and, and really boost this cooperation under the umbrella of the Union for the Mediterranean 5 plus 5 uh, through the uh, program Water 5 plus 5 uh, of which uh, Ramiro has uh, just spoken. It is uh, what we do uh, at the IEM on the um, possible uh, setting up a world observatory for water. Uh, this is still uh, in the collective spirit, non-conventional, because uh, uh, we are going to take the water sea or the use water to uh, transform and treat and transform into fresh water, uh, at least for a, an agricultural and industrial usage. And so we're going to present the results of this uh, study in Dakar in 2022. What should be the priorities for the integrated management? It has been presented by Ramiro, but I would like to that Ajir uh, should go to uh, the United Nations and not only uh, the, um, the, the entities for the access to water, but also to other ODD because uh, uh, because there are 17 ODD and water is, is present in uh, 12, in 17 of that water and food, water and education, etc. So water is is part um, in, in the, among the objectives of sustainable development. So this is a very important uh, issue. Obstacles, I would, I would mention three interdependent and there are the three pillars for the for the success as governance as the knowledge and, and finance so these three uh, obstacles have to be overcome and there should be a before and after covid-19 as it has been an uh, uh, before and after paris agreement because everybody used them to even mr biden uh, refers to them so if the United States presidents even uh, take that into account is, is that it's worth so the uh, so we have to keep uh, the, the 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 positive um, the positive effects of this crisis, as Churchill said, uh, uh, do not miss uh, the the profit of this of a crisis. So we have worked on the governance, but at at state and political level, legal aspects which are very important. But we have to go down to the on the spot to the operational level. Otherwise, we will won't get to gain. The, the trust of the population and the, uh, we have a good uh, management on the spot. So the knowledge, not only to have uh, ongoing good training for men and women working in water, but also to um, the aware making, make aware all the, uh, all the uh, participants the youth included, because the young people will have to manage this problem in the future. What are the 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 key reforms and the pri priority measures to implement for a for a sustainable management? It is to well know the data on conventional water and included the deep waters that uh, very often they are transborder, cross-border, and there are diplomatic uh, problems, but we have to overcome these problems. The Sahel Observatory uh, within the Maghreb is responsible for that and is very good. They are doing a very good work, but it's not uh, known enough. We don't know what the observatory is doing other observatories they don't know what the observatory in Sahel they don't know even the professionals sometimes so uh, we have to share this information so that we become aware of the reality of the resources and the, the same thing for the non-conventional waters and uh, I think the next speakers are going to speak of that we have to work together uh, 
the creation of the uh, non-conventional water um, observatory and has been a long-term report because we have to aim 2050 what is going to happen because today we speak in, in two, uh, two, 2050 in terms of population but we have to uh, speak about 2050 in terms of water we spoke about resources with non-conventional resources, which are new resources that come to be added to, for example, the subterranean resources and surface resources. So we have absolutely to work on the demand, demand and a new analyze of the demand to taking all the participants, all the stakeholders. So we spoke about agriculture, we have spoken about agriculture, but without the, the, the farmers, we are not going to get to, to a solution. We are going to help them, but we need their cooperation. And uh, in tourism as well, uh, in environment, uh, biodiversity, Today, we really need to guarantee uh, and allow the environment to maintain this biodiversity by maintaining uh, levels in, the, in, in dams and, uh, and rivers. And we have to take into this into account, otherwise uh, we destroy biodiversity. And uh, there are new laws in France now that uh, oblige us to uh, take into account of biodiversity and how and the environment when sharing water. We need to invest in solutions related to the correct use of resource and the loss and reduction in loss in waste. And uh, I'd like to congratulate you for talking about that in the five plus five because not many people are talking about it. So it's it's about the good allocation and good management of uh, of the water resource. We need to invest in the uh, in continuous uh, training and uh, digitalization, which we'll talk about later and awareness raising amongst uh, water users, starting with uh, young people, with children. Water use in agriculture is a priority. 80% of the resource goes to agriculture, so we really need to make a big uh, effort there. Also, an urban use, because these are the people who vote, and uh, they um, establish who the politicians are. In Morocco, when it comes to the water use in industry, is very interesting. In Morocco, about 15 years ago, asked its, uh, the OCP the, uh, to find solutions to no longer take water from natural resources, uh, from rivers, uh, for its mining uh, purposes. It's, it's a mining company. Now they have 50% of their own resources, that is reuse of or used water and desalination. And so that uh, allowed uh, another uh, funder for um, water treatment for the cities. And so the idea is that by 2030 they get to 100%. I think that's a, a really good example. Tunisia should follow its lead for the phosphates and, uh, and for other um, industries, uh, uh, oil industry, because uh, they require a lot of water resources. So how can we sustain and reinforce the uh, participation of the local population? Well, we all need to promote the idea of service to the public. What we do in agriculture, what we do in, in cities, what we do in industry, is we provide a service to the, the public. Whether it's a private company, um, or whatever they're called, that's not, that's not the important thing. The important thing is that the public receive the service and are aware of what it is. In Haiti, uh, in the poorest countries in the world, the youngest people, the poorest people pay for this, they prepay for phone services, but they don't pay for water. They don't have to pay, so they don't have it. They don't get water. But they're, they're prepared to pay for a service, but they don't have the water service. So they, they, when you prepare to pay, you're aware of it. Now, COVID-19 has uh, reminded us of the situation, reminded us of the essential importance uh, of having food and water services at all time. War and soap are the first barrier to uh, COVID, as, uh, as which has been said from the beginning. And uh, hygiene, quality hygiene, 
that it's thanks to uh, correct hygiene we can predict the impact of a, a of a, um, an epidemic such as uh, uh, COVID. Now we get four or five days advance notice of what's going to happen in a city or in a neighborhood based on our hygiene. So this is the very positive side. So if we can do it for uh, COVID, we can do it for other types of uh, pandemics. Now the agencies in the water agencies, we already have that in France, Spain, Morocco, Algeria, we've seen this. And as Ramiro uh, showed us, this really needs to be used throughout the Mediterranean. And these water agencies need to work to uh, exchange their experiences and to um, move this forward. The EMU uh, suggests even to associate populations through these sorts of mechanisms. We need to go further because in a water agency, you have all different stakeholders, so the, the, the different uh, users, the representatives of users, politicians, uh, operators, but we need to go further. I think that today we need to go to uh, citizen uh, agreements where we need to ask questions to citizens. And this experience uh, that they had in France, some people criticised it, but I think it was was very good. I think it was a, uh, but I think we need to start again. And I think war works, water works for this very well. There's certain, uh, why not having a cross-cutting approach to water? You know, your organisation funds uh, cross-cutting uh, initiatives. I don't think they should all be in different silos. I think they should all, everyone should be uh, aware of uh, the, um, the challenges. Now, the, the last issue, to what extent and how does the water strategy in the Western Mediterranean, could it be uh, help to reinforce uh, capacities in, uh, and, and training in water management? I'd say, first of all, well, I'd like to congratulate Umid for the quality and the, the clarity of his... Uh, of what he said about action plans and uh, and what, what was being done in 2016 and what was approved in Morocco. Well, <clears throat> Here I'd like to remind you of the three main themes of so this reinforcing convergence of politics uh, policies uh, in Western uh, Mediterranean towards uh, water use reduction and secondly promoting and improving water management. These are very important issues in the Western Mediterranean. So the convergence of, of countries of 5 plus 5 is an essential and the EMU um, uh, needs to perform its role. Regarding cooperation for renewable energies, uh, the experience of uh, finding solutions in non-conventional water as with the renewable energies and digitalization and renewable energies this can allow this cooperation to work in both senses. Because water, non-conventional water resources are in the south. The experience is in the south. And digital is also in the south. We've seen this yesterday. We see this every day. In Marseille, there's something that happens every year, which is called Emerging Valley, which reveals all of the African know-how in the large sense of Africa in the area of uh, digital. And it's amazing what we can see there. So digital applied to water is something very useful and it can certainly be developed in the uh, Mediterranean. We also need to, um, to improve resilience of infrastructure over time in order to ensure access to water to everyone. We don't need new infrastructures. We need to optimize existing structures. And there's a 40% is not necessarily lost, but is not used. We don't know where this 40% is, only 60% is, uh, so we produce 100 and we build just 60. So we only know of 60% of the water, so there's a lot of work to be done on this. There's a lot of physical loss that we need to work on, but also uh, commercial losses. I'm going to finish with uh, an example from Provence in Roquefort-Bourg. Now, this was... Building, this was built in 1850, 
we're now refurbish, refurbishing this for the hundred, next 150 years. Who in 1850 would have said that the return on investment would have taken 300 years? No one. So having uh, lasting uh, infrastructure is key to sanitation. You need, uh, you need good engineering at the right rate. Uh, we need a quality of construction in the waterworks and we need uh, a maintenance of these uh, works is one of the solutions, not the only one, but one of the important solutions. There's a lot of work to be done on that and I finished with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's very difficult to, to give a presentation after Mr. Martinez and Mr. Missanier, but I'm going to try to be as innovative as possible. First of all, I'd like to thank Leonid and the Union for the Mediterranean and Casarbe for inviting me. It's, great, it's a great honor to be with you today to talk about the problem of water in the Mediterranean and to try to implement uh, actions and solutions together in order to preserve uh, the blue gold in our dear Mediterranean. So I'm going to give, start with a few figures. According to the UN, four people out of ten suffer from water scarcity around the world. And in the Mediterranean, which has 7.4% of the world population, unfortunately is not spared this problem. About 160 million of the 420 million Mediterranean uh, population live in a country where there's more than 2,000 square uh, uh, cubic kilometers of water per person. And a large proportion of them live under uh, um, the uh, threshold of poverty in the five plus five countries in Libya, Malta, Tunisia and Algeria. This situation is exacerbated by a, a population and uh, standards of life that uh, are constantly rising, as Mr. Misino said. So to give you an idea, the population in the five plus five countries has increased by 60 million between 1990 and 2020. The, so the availability is analysed according to demand, and uh, and this, looking for this balance, that when we're talking about scarcity. So here we have a problem of disparity between supply and demand. So governance, more sustainable governance policies are required at a national, uh, regional, and cross-border uh, level by reinforcing planning and implementation of operational strategies that are effective in the countries as well as promoting collaboration uh, across borders at a sub-regional level as a way of avoiding conflicts. The absence of uh, a legal framework for decentralized uh, management of resources and of, of funding for implementing plans uh, when they're defined as well as the lack of availability of data are real obstacles to a proper integrated management of the resource. So we need to facilitate access to data, whether for politicians or citizens, is essential. Now, there's a, a, an important project uh, of the UFM and the EMU are members of this project, was created in 2014 and it aims to create a platform on knowledge on water in the Mediterranean region to facilitate access to data at a local level and national and regional levels. So there are activities that were done in four countries, Morocco, Tunisia, Lib uh, Lebanon and Tunisia. Sorry, Libya and, uh, uh, and, uh, and this is, project is very much underway. So for uh, a sustainable and optimum management of the resource, we need to improve governance and, uh, and create a, an evolving legal framework. We need to reduce tension over the resource by optimizing demand and using non-conventional sources. We also need to encourage the transfer of knowledge to reinforce the skills of countries in, and to respond to... Uh, 
climate change. Now we have extreme events such as uh, more frequent floods and, uh, and droughts and uh, so these models need to anticipate this so we can have short, medium and long term responses to these uh, difficulties. We also need to ensure that ag ag water ecosystems can support uh, climate change because these terrestrial uh, water environments are essential against protecting against floods um, uh, and for regulating the supply of drinking water. I'd also like to talk the most water uh, greedy uh, sectors. This has already been talked about, but uh, agriculture um, makes up 80% of total water consumption. So if we work on the consumption of water on agriculture, that can have a significant impact on the resource. There are research and development projects funded by the European Commission and other initiatives such as Prima or the Water GPI, which provide tools for helping decision makers for, um, and for agriculture uh, to better manage the resource. And also the ProMed, uh, a project which is funded by Prima and this project creates a platform to reduce entrance water, energy and fertilizers, uh, reducing inputs, inputs while also increasing profits to, uh, for farmers. Another uh, very water greedy sector which is tourism, and it's true that uh, a tourist does consume five to ten times more, time, more water than an inhabitant and there is a research project called Demomed which was funded a few years ago by the European Commission as well. And the aim was to provide solutions for uh, water treatment for uh, irrigation. And the project has shown that it's possible to reduce a consumption of uh, fresh water by 30%. And a tool was developed which suggests the perfect solution according to the structure. So I've given you these examples to say that the European Commission and uh, other regional national initiatives already are investing in projects and are already producing tools for use water users. So it would be a shame if we don't uh, use these tools. We need to encourage the transfer of the results of these research projects as far as possible. I'd also like to talk about awareness raising. We need to have a solid awareness raising uh, um, system so that uh, um, the local users um, are directly involved. There's also water prices. They need to be studied in order to guarantee water for everyone but also to ensure uh, the right sort of cost to ensure sustainability of the sector. It's also impossible to involve, important to involve young people, even children, in schools in research pro and development projects and awareness raising uh, activities. The participation of populations uh, n requires better governance structures. Participation of local population is, uh, is very important. For example, there's a project that's also uh, funded by the European Commission and they uh, called Hydrosa uh, is implementing solutions for circular economy in the water sector, which are solutions that were inspired by nature. Local stakeholders are directly involved in uh, these technical solutions to create local economic uh, activities. And finally, I'd like to talk about the water strategy in Western Mediterranean, which lists urgent actions to be taken into account in the country and provides a roadmap to encourage capacity building and collaboration between uh, the two shores. It's very ambitious. It needs to be accompanied by funding in order to be implemented and a follow-up mechanism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bolma. I'd like to uh, say, well, you talked about research and, and development. We need to give a role to the only resource which is unlimited, which is human creativity. That's the only resource which is unlimited. And so we need to use this resource. 
to sort out a major problem of a limited resource. Finally, Francisco, who represents young people today in this uh, forum. So enlighten us with your approach because it's young people who are going to need to manage this uh, problem in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, I will talk in English because my French is not enough okay, to do a speech here. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to, on the name of MediWatt of our network, to, to thank the organizer, you know, to, to, to give us the opportunity to have voice in this kind of event, so interesting for us. Um, I am learning a lot about this organization that are talking here during these two days and is inspiring us, you know, to, to keep going and, and continue working as, as young water professional. Well, youth are amongst the most affected by the economic, social and environmental challenges facing the Mediterranean region. Okay, we, we must keep clear that including unemployment and also underemployment. Okay. Jews, however, have the great potential to be the key partners in designing effective response to these ongoing challenges. Yet, for their genuine and meaningful engagement in policy making, the current participation model in which youth are passive and reactive actors must be changed. And MediWatt was created in, let me introduce very briefly, our network was created in 2017 in, in Marcel in, a, in, a, in an event that was organized by CMI. And we were inviting around 20 young water professionals in order to, to start to do cooperation. And I remember that this event was really, was really inspiring for us and we decided to try to create a network. We were only 20 young water professionals from 10 different countries, but let's try to do this first step. I remember that was five years before, it was very difficult for us, okay, because we were very enthusiastic but with no structure in order to organize and to canalize this knowledge that I perceived. I decided to coordinate this group and I am really proud now five years before, uh, sorry, five years after that we reached a lot of our objectives that uh, five years before was nothing. We start from, from zero. I would like to, to, um, to show you some of the achievements that we reached during these five years. Um, we decide to, 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 be, to, be, to, to be support in, in three main pillars, okay? So our main goals were, was, were to connect and engage the Mediterranean young water professional working on different topics, okay? So from a multidisciplinary point of view, because as the, as the network start to grow, now we are almost 200 people, we realize that uh, water, um, can't be afford only from, from one point of view. We are a multidisciplinary team working on different topics like water and education, water and migration. Of course, this topic were always by the hand of CMI and the, the interest of, of CMI that they transmit to us. Water treatment and reuse, um, water and energy, water and sanitation, okay? So we are professional entrepreneurship, a researcher, professors, activists working on water on, from a different perspective. And another goal was to, to create a knowledge platform where exchange ideas and practices. Okay? We were talking uh, today about the, the experience exchange. For us, it was very also inspiring you know, for, for, for all the members how they motivated to see another success cases in the Mediterranean region. And the third goal was to establish links between the youth and decision makers. And we know that this is the most difficult and we know that this is the last step, but we think and we believe that we are ready to, to do this, this step now. 
Well, some of the achievement that we, we have reached during this five years is like knowledge production. We, we peer review a lot of different papers on different topics. We organize different technical webinars also. All of these, um, all of these activities with the hand of CMI that they also um, help us on the support organizing these, these activities. We collaborate on organizing different contexts like the Water Hero, that is one of the most success contexts uh, organizing by the, by the water professional with CMI. Another achievement is the capacity building. Um, we are all the time organizing you know, um, technical workshops and webinars depending on what our members is, is demanding us. Um, Another one is the International Academic Exchange and Collaborations. We are proud to know that we reach uh, our own foundings participating in, in research projects. For example, now we are in, in, in one Prima project collaborating with a new online collaboration platform for research and entrepreneurship. Um, we have another project, Morocco Palestine that was a, 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 a call that was organized by the University of Delft. So yesterday we were talking about collaboration south, south, north, north. So we are also pushing these collaborations. And also, for example, we are collaborating also on another project with CMI about water migration project with the UK government, where we are an, an active member of, of this project. Also, another achievement is the, the national sub-chapters. This was very interesting for us to see that, okay, as, as we start to grow as, as, a, as, as a network in the Mediterranean, also in each country, they have their own sub-chapter, you know, where they can create their own activities and ask for funding to the, 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 the government of this country, okay? So, it was also interesting to see that the members also want wants to be in the Mediterranean, but also to get funding at, at regional level. And the last one is the policy influence, okay? This, this one is that um, we propose a, a new approach, a new integrated knowledge participation model where the, to be applied in the water sector, okay? Where youth network are placed at the intersection between the policy making and grassroots implementation. In this model, the youth network work in a multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary teams, forming different thematic clusters, such as climate and environmental preservation, entrepreneurship, educational and skills, and gover governance and political inclusion. Such clusters are dynamic knowledge hubs, where the young professionals from different disciplines are with diverse background, generate, filter, and channel evidence-based solution for water management and government. So in this way, the interaction between the youth and the policy makers is or can be more fluid, leading to more effective policies for the water sector. So finally, uh, I would like to, to to exchange with you also which are our future challenges as, as, as a network uh, and also our difficulties now. As we grow as a network, when, when you grow, sometimes it's, it's really nice to be success, but it's difficult to manage, okay? Because we are receiving new members every time that was very inspiring on the, on the achievement that we reached in the last five years. So it's difficult to keep motivated these new members, you know, because the youth are really motivated, but uh, is dismotivated very fast. So it's difficult to keep motivated in the long term. So, um, and for, the, for this motivation, uh, we believe that we need investment on this network, okay? I think we believe that the, the, this network, and we realized during these five years, has a great potential. And with all the MET organization and initiative like five plus five, that I think is, it's, it's a really good um, initiative to implement this kind of network, we need to create together a roadmap that helps to integrate this network like MediWatt 
and, and transform these strategies into actions. Okay? So my last message to, to everyone here is that um, youth or Mediterranean youth in the, in the sector of water is ready to be involved in policy making. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Francisco. I think that um, there were very many ideas that arose uh, during this discussion and I think it merits to try to at least gather some of them because, um, well, we all agree in the diagnosis, water is a very limited resource, especially in the region, because of basically climate change and uh, demography. We'll not enter more on, on the diagnosis. I think that the diagnosis is relatively easy. What is more difficult are the solutions, and solutions that will never be full solutions, but at least contribute approaches. And here, I think that, that we, have, we have had a discussion on the issues of demand and competing demands, mainly urban use, agriculture, that's the main consumer, uh, industry, tourism, and I think that all these competing demands need to be one way or another, well, I think that they, they need the social debate on how to put a hierarchy on these competing demands. The other part is on the part of the offer, what, how we can improve the availability of water. And research and innovation, I think it's a key tool. I'm, I understand that it would seem that I'm just trying to get on my own field, but I think that research and innovation is very important but also using non-conventional waters and trying to be as, uh, as comprehensive as possible in the use of um, avoiding leakages, as uh, Alain was saying, and trying to uh, be with solutions that at the same time are long, uh, sustainable uh, along the sustainable development goals, but as well uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructures uh, that, that have a view on the long term. And I think that this is also very important. So we need to have the data, because without the data we'll never understand which is the actual diagnosis, but what is worse, we'll not, we'll not be able to see whether we are ahead or backwards. And so we need to monitor very clearly uh, the data and work with them very, uh, in a very uh, precise and accurate way. So um, with all these ideas, I'd like you to react on whether we can systematize uh, a little bit all these points so that, that uh, I would ask you not to concentrate on the diagnosis, but rather on the potential solutions. We assume that we understand the problem among all of us and we only now need to, or we, we will focus better on how to approach the problem in the region. So who wants to start? Ramiro, venga. And uh, I'll, I'll give you the floor later on. I'm not just <laughs> preventing you from intervening, but uh, I like first a reaction of those who are popping ideas here. Thanks. Merci Octavio. Comme je parlais les premiers, je vais faire la première réaction si vous êtes d'accord. Tout d'abord, permettez-moi souligner que je ne suis pas exactement d'accord avec une chose que vous venez de dire. Et les caractéristiques de la région, c'est les changements climatiques et la démographie. Pour nous, pour les experts qui travaillent dans les domaines de l'eau, depuis d'après beaucoup d'années, les caractéristiques ce sont le climat et la démographie, pas les changements climatiques. Bon. Avant les changements climatiques, nous sommes déjà dans cinq régions dont la rareté de l'eau c'est la caractéristique hydroclimatique principale. Ça veut dire aussi que précisément pour ces raisons, beaucoup de nous nous sommes convaincus de que nous avons déjà l'expérience de faire face à la rareté de l'eau à la Méditerranée. 
si vous voulez, nous sommes mieux préparés que d'autres régions du monde pour faire face à les, les diminutions des ressources en eau à cause de la changement climatique. Parce que nous avons l'expérience de se battre avec ces questions pendant tout, de, toute notre histoire. Et je laisse d'autres questions pour mes collègues, mais je voudrais faire aussi une petite réaction à ce que je viens d'écouter de Francisco, pour vous souligner que dans les processus simplissants O, comme peut-être vous connaissez dans les dialogues simplissants, tous les, tous les processus sectoriels se sont mis en place par l'initiative de conjoint de deux pays, un pays du Nord et un pays du Sud. Dans le cas de l'eau, ça a été une initiative entre l'Espagne et l'Algérie. Et on a fait une structure de travail très pareille à les groupes de des secteurs qui existaient déjà, comme la défense, les transports, l'énergie, etc. Mais dans les simplissants eaux, c'est la première fois dans les sectoriels simplissants qui ont engagé les institutions non gouvernementales. C'est-à-dire, ce n'est pas seulement une réunion des ministères, des directions générales de l'eau. Au contraire, nous avons travaillé avec beaucoup d'organisations de, de la Méditerranée. L'IME a été présente dans les réunions de travail, les SEMIT aussi, beaucoup, beaucoup plus d'autres. Et je fais une invitation officielle à la jeunesse de, 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 de la Méditerranée pour qu'ils travaillent avec nous dans les 5 plus 100 Or. Merci. Bref, voilà. Très bref. Le diagnostic. So the diagnostic is, is known, but we know it, we. And also, if today if there are people that have come and not water experts, so they have learned cer certain things. So we have to spread and to make this uh, diagnosis known and, and so that people are aware of the situation. This is essential. Without it, we won't get anywhere. The solutions, as Ramiro said, experience uh, answers that we have to bring to this uh, Dakar forum, which will be a forum of answers uh, uh, in 2022. More than 200 projects have been uh, labeled already, so it exists. But before that, we have to, or at the same time, to uh, make the population more aware at all levels, the user, water users pri in priority, but others too, because we all use waters, we all are uh, water users. But it is the uh, uh, cross cutting cross-cutting um, cross uh, feature that interests us. So all the sectors are concerned by water. So in all these objectives, we have to talk about water because we have the impression that it's something natural. To have water is uh, we open the tap every morning and there will be water is something natural and everybody's calm. But we have to inform them and uh, we have to serve the ones not having water, but also to make everybody be aware uh, and for example i heard somebody said say in france but what is the use of making economies in water in france if we have water in france but there is a scarcity of water in the on the planet so the quantity of water yeah we are lucky it is more or less the same it, we have difficulties because the population increase. So the second topic is the demand. It's very important to work on the issue of the demand. And to work on that, we have first to make everybody aware what is at stake concerning water. This is essential. So it is a big piece of work of communication through the media as we manage to do with uh, other things. Um, 
for example, Yafos Bertrand have done wonderful things. So we have to make it known. We have to communicate more and more and um, to younger and younger people. So in innovation, you are totally right because oh, we have the impression that we know everything, but we have plenty of things to discover. For example, for non-conventional, uh, what are the, uh, for example, uh, the desalination, for example, uh, what is going to be? There are in France a lot of debates. Uh, sometimes we, in France, uh, there are organisms that refuse to finance desalination because that it, there is a big impact on the environment. Because the problem is, what are we going to do with all the salt we have after the desalination? So in Morocco and others are uh, creating in Tunisia too, and even in France, uh, we are doing things. And also energy based on water. Uh, gas uh, from uh, used waters uh, and also the mud in the, uh, in the sanitation state plants. So we can evaluate that in uh, agriculture, but also in energy. So all, all that means work, a lot of work. We have to work on that. I, I agree that uh, it is a very important solution to face this shortage of water, but also I am convinced that another piece of work has to be done before uh, tackling the non-conventional water. It is the management of the demand. Uh, that it has to be through a, a good governance of water and through training, through the data. So we cannot uh, manage correctly only the things we know. So we, it's very important to have the access to the information for the policy makers or for the citizens. And we have a lot of work to the awareness uh, from a very early age at school because uh, making people, making children aware, we can also uh, make adults aware, I think. As we are talking about non-conventional water, I think it's, it's my research field, you know, we, we work about um, water reuse, on the use of reclaimed water. And I can say that, uh, as I said before on my, on my speech, that um, to extrapolate, you know, the success cases, is, is, it's, for me, it's one of the best two and the easiest two, in order to, to create new projects about water reuse. You know, I have done a lot of technical webinars inside of, the, of this network of Medivot, and they inspire a lot, you know? For example, I am from Murcia, from the southeast of Spain, where we reuse 98% of the, of the wastewater, and they inspire a lot because they, they don't believe that this is possible, okay? And also they organize trips with different users, with irrigation communities from different countries to come to Murcia, thanks of this webinar, and it's just to show them success cases. This is in Murcia, because I live in Murcia, but uh, also for me, I was impressed to see another success cases in different countries in the Mediterranean, like in Egypt, like in Morocco, like in Tunisia, a lot. So it's, it's this knowledge, knowledge exchange, from my point of view, it's, it's really important to do it. Thank you very much. Turn on the microphone, please. Sorry. May I ask? Yes, please. John O'Rourke is here, please. There is a word that has not been uttered uh, in the presentations, and for me is essential, and it's the price of water, the price of water, because finally, many things uh, we're talking about, uh, we want to, be, to find a solution, uh, but a, a good distance towards solution is if the real uh, price of water externalities were correctly uh, evaluated and thought about in the water price. Um, 
In Algeria this summer there was uh, many uh, blackouts, many shortages of water because water is, is lacking but at the same time law um, practically has no price, so practically free. Is it better to just cut water as uh, Mr. Maisonnier uh, was saying, we open the tap and it is only uh, free? Or maybe it would be more rational to increase the price of water so that the reality would be reflected in the economy. So uh, all that had um, consequences. Uh, uh, on demography, if the public services uh, are free or they are subsidized, uh, will have uh, it will give uh, uh, an economic signal for uh, for the demographic growth that uh, sometimes do not reflect certain realities. Thank you, because it is a, a difficult topic, but it is a, uh, crucial because water, because the most expensive water is the one that do not exist. Uh, so, so we really have to start a, a, a debate on that. The gentleman there. Thank you, Daniel Schlosser. The the problem is a serious problem, very, very serious problem, uh, and, and it, he's right to say it, the measured uh, scarcity of water. It is a problem concerning uh, everybody, absolutely everybody. So when everybody concerns everybody, uh, the most important thing is information. So beyond information is awareness of the problem. And this goes through education because just a raw information is not enough. So we have a problem with the Mediterranean. It is the number of, uh, of uh, voices that are dealing with the same problem. We have heard many often, we have seen in these two days, many uh, Mediterranean examples uh, all of them are great uh, because w we work with the best uh, experts, which is so wonderful to be invited here. But but there are no voices, there are no op common voices or unique voices because sometimes we need a, a face, one face, one voice to speak to uh, to the people. And maybe one of the problems is the multiplicity of institutions, which all of them are very good. Made. Maybe sometimes we need one uh, single place, one single institution, one single voice to address the people. And uh, Marois uh, spoke about a conserva uh, observatory, so we need a uh, 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 water observatory in the Mediterranean where uh, there will be a conjunction, not an institution with walls and administration, but uh, at a certain moment in the year uh, or, or to gather there to, to, to have a joint work of all people working on the field, having good ideas, and this would be something we should in, uh, create for the future because the topic is very serious and we cannot be satisfied with the things we are doing now, which is the best uh, we can do, but we have to do even better. It's my opinion, it's not France. Yeah, we have mentioned this observatory, uh, the lady. Interesting inter uh, uh, floors. Uh, I am. A, I, I would like to to say I am a um, senior researcher at the um, International Center for Security in University uh, Francisco de Vitoria, and I would like to introduce myself because my question is on on on, nor on the subject that I used to tackle um, the water management and the water situation. 
uh, normally. It is from the point of view of the international security as well. You know, uh, I am. I know that all this subject and all this question that you uh, put here on floors about demography and about agriculture, everything around the Mediterranean basin is very important. But uh, in my mind, um, I have another idea that it is that the Mediterranean um, has a, a very near a, in a large in a large Mediterranean the Sahel region, and the Sahel region as well um, is it has to face a lot of challenges on security related with uh, as well with uh, with agriculture with the climate and climate change and all all these other factors. So I think that the, um, there is a, a great pre impression on on the Maghreb uh, for for these reasons. And I would like to know in all these projects that you are taking uh, normally in the daily in your daily uh, works. Um, if you are taking in account um, this challenge that the Sahel region uh, will push on on the Maghreb, especially, but other uh, Ramiro talk about the international uh, situation of water, and I think it is very important because Mediterranean is not only the Riverian uh, countries in the basins; it's very important other uh, near uh, regions like Sahel nowadays. Thank Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an important dimension. And uh, in fact, all Europeans, well, this was Brodel, not me, who said it, uh, that uh, Europe is protected by the Sahara thanks to the Mediterranean, who is a buffer between uh, the, the Sahara uh, weather and. Uh, Monsieur, s'il vous plaît. Y luego tu blanca. Bonjour and merci pour le. Thank you and uh, thank you to all the panelists. We have learned a lot. I would like to uh, um, say something and then a question. Uh, what I, the consumers, we are, we live in the presumption, the assume, assuming the the presence of water, and in our daily life, we don't have this awareness. Uh, that we have to make an effort, really sm very small, to put a little, some drops, to spare some drops that can become something else. So the second thing is, I haven't heard this morning, maybe I missed something, about the dimension of new technologies in this problem. In this problem. I would like to know if the if the state has new technologies that could allow us to maximize, to make the most profit uh, of the water we have, or maybe, um, or maybe the just to spare some of the water you you lose sometimes. Um, I just want to say a few words <clears throat> about the involvement of the youth that. Francisco already presented. As, as he said, the Mediwat was born in the context of the Center for Mediterranean Integration, and we have invested in this network since 2017. And I have to tell you that during COVID, when we couldn't travel, we couldn't go to the countries, uh, the members of this network were there in the different countries to help us collect data because they were in their daily lives already working on the issues that were of very high relevance for us. So the value of this network is very high, and that's why we will continue investing in them. And it's great to see them already taken off. They don't need us anymore in some cases, and that's the success we want to, to see. And um, I also want to say that um, just in support of what um, my, my dear friend Daniel said, um, we are so many of us working for the same causes and it would be great to emerge with some kind of a roadmap. I'm encouraged by the Malta Mediterranean Forum that we are all going to participate in December. Then there will be uh, Dakar is the next one. Uh, can we continue working together to build this roadmap? Uh, Prima also, collaboration with Prima. I look forward to it. Um, we need to continue supporting each other or avoiding overlaps and working together towards the, the common goals. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, 
Um, let me just to finish ask the speakers, please be short, but I'd like you to most of all uh, to discuss briefly the issue of the prize because I think that we didn't uh, touch on it and you are absolutely right that there is an essential factor that we didn't mention and, and I think that we should not hide us from that very difficult discussion. So Ramiro, first, be as short as possible. A message très court. It's clear that the message. A short message. The non-conventional resources are more expensive than the natural ones. It means that there will be some uh, balance between uh, the demand and offer uh, management. As, okay. Uh, water price is an essential point, very important, and has been underlined by uh, the lady here. But you are right to put it on the table again because is not uh, there is no use in throwing stones to a country or another because in Algeria the situation is serious because there is no water price and is a country that uh, is suffering uh, from a lack of resources i have um, um, in uh, worked in uh, 2000 2001 worked in uh, Algeria at that time there wasn't any dissemination and so the situation was quite serious uh, there wasn't uh, the uh, dams had no more water so we had to uh, to create a, a special uh, engine special um, machine to uh, transform the the mud in the uh, dam is called a hydrocyclone uh, this is like a hydro that creates a cyclone uh, to separate the mud with water uh, before treating it. So uh, behind that there was the creation of the station of uh, uh, desalination in Nigeria that is a big part uh, today, the, uh, the water supplied for the capital. But uh, the population of Algiers has kept growing and today we have the same situation that we had in 2000. Uh, so we have known some improvement with water. Uh, uh, the only H24 uh, water because that means that there is no water um, 24 hours a day because in France, so we don't know what it is because we open the tap and there is water. And that is a very important national, but there is no association with the price. We just uh, also, we work with customers. There is a, a price, but it's extremely low and it is a political decision. So it is complicated because Morocco has not followed the same strategy. There is is a reality of listening. Uh, so in Tunisia, there are like like slots of tariff that does not allow to cover the cost. An average um, uh, slot uh, that is going to pay more expensive. So every country has a different uh, strategy for the prices. But in Spain or France, uh, at least in France, uh, one third of the price of water goes to water agencies. Not in Spain, it says, but in France, when when uh, or, or when we pay three euros the uh, cubic meter, one euro goes to the agencies, the water agency, because these agencies do finance uh, improvements, etc., and projects. So it is a system that, for me, I think uh, French, but. Uh, well, it has been mentioned by Ramiro too. It is a good system. And then each level, each country has their level. So we can have uh, systems of subsidies that allow to, uh, to support. For example, in Morocco, it would be easier because energy is easier to sell uh, than water or make pay 
by, than water, but that can have uh, the same um, uh, like uh, combined uh, entities, energy and water. Um, that could be a solution to have, uh, but you are right, it is a fun, a essential, uh, but to pay the price. We have to have the service, so I wanted to insist first on the service. If you, if you receive the service, it is easier to ask people to pay for the service. We need uh, an awareness that I have a service. It is pu public service, but it is a service to the public. To be free, the European countries, for example, uh, are developing a free transport, but, but it doesn't mean that it is a bad trans transport. It, it is a political choice. But for water is... Uh, but it is the opposite approach because for transport uh, we want to encourage people to use it more and more but for water to be to encourage people not to waste water in Algeria people just fill their bathtub and then they empty the, the, their bathtub so that leads to wasting water uh, Octavi uh, said uh, the, the most expensive water is the one we don't have it. Uh, for example, in, in uh, shanty towns, a bottle of water would cost like 20 times uh, the water you would obtain uh, from your tub. But it is uh, our impact, French impact on the Mediterranean. We are experts in developing organisms that are creating the same thing. Uh, in France, we can say, oh, wow, we are the strongest and everything, but, but I think there should be a, a water Mediterranean Institute where everybody is associated, a steering committee preparing this water forum, all the institutions, related to water, are there rainbow, etc. So most of them, the Union for Mediterranean, 5 plus 5 is not there, but, but uh, so yeah, 5 plus 5 is on the political level. So uh, it was really at the beginning, it was the will to uh, gather everybody, so we have to carry on. Uh, so through the creation observatory or uh, there is already a Mediterranean forum which is gathering all the institutions, the say, CMI, etc. So, um, yes, I'd like to come back to the issue of uh, prices, which I uh, mentioned briefly in my analysis before. And we know that uh, pricing is a way we can reduce consumption. But there are also two issues here. The first is that water needs to be uh, guaranteed to everyone. And we also need to ensure the um, sustainability of the sector. Now, yes, it's true that the price of water is very low. In, the, in Tunisia, it certainly is. And so we need to review water prices. But it needs to be accompanied by an awareness raising strategy. I think that's the word that's come up, the, the, the term that's come up the most in our session. In order to avoid um, social uprising, because working on increasing the price could have so, in, important social impacts. Well, for me, the key point is the public awareness and education, okay? I think that from the technological point of view, we can reach potable water, you know, from the wastewater. So it's not a problem, but the problem is the, the education of the people. And this keep a, a long period, even in Murcia, even in Murcia, because everyone thinks that, okay, people in Murcia like to reuse, and this is not true. Sometimes they reuse because they don't have another water. Okay, yeah, so um, when we talk with, uh, with, with the irrigation communities, for example, I remember seven years before, nobody wanted to reuse in the north of Murcia, you know, because they have enough water. 
And it was seven years, you know, of workshop talking about the advantages of reusing this water. If you saw the real, the huge amount of advantages to use reclaimed water treated in the correct way, if you show them, they will pay this money for, for the cubic meter of reclaimed water. But see, it's, not, no, it's, it's not easy, you know, because also now we, we are seeing the new law for the European Union about reuse. So when the user, not, not only the grower, when the users see that they have a law for use one water resource and they don't have a law to another water resource, what, what would you prefer to, to use is at the end is for them it's, it's, it's a mess you know to, to, to comply with the law you know with very restriction limits of different parameters so um, from our experience and if, if you want that uh, the, the people reuse it you need to show the benefits of this reclaimed water you know every day every day with demonstration plots for example is very very interesting also for them Thank you very much. I think I need because we are uh, already beyond the limit. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry that we couldn't be more systematic, but we do not have the time. Thank you to the speakers. You've been very, I think, inspiring. And thank you to the audience for your indulgence and uh, your participation. There is a coffee break now, isn't it? Yes. Bonjour tout le monde. On va commencer ce Hello everyone. We're going to start the last work session today. And I'm very happy and honored to be the moderator of this session. Thanks very much to all the organizers. For moderating this uh, uh, session towards smart Western Mediterranean cities, harnessing the potential of the digital transformation for sustainable urban development. In this session, we have uh, five speakers who I'm going to present now uh, online. We have Madam Hayar, uh, Excellency Minister of uh, Solidarity and uh, and quality in the family, and she's a professor at the university in uh, Casablanca. Mr. Daudi, president of Tunisian Smart Cities, Victoria Jimenez, who's in charge of the development, urban development uh, area, and the secretariat of the uh, Union for the Mediterranean, Fernando Herrero, general director for innovation and entrepreneurship in the municipality of Madrid, and Oriol Barba, the director of MedCities. So without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to uh, the first speaker uh, to speak for 10 minutes. Uh, so that will be Awatif Khayar. I hope that the connection is working for, to Her Excellency Awatif Khayar. And I'd like to congratulate you for your nomination. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to EUMED uh, for inviting me to, to speak. I'd just like to thank the director. And I'm very happy to share the panel with these uh, experts from the two Mediterranean shores. Now, I'm going to talk generally about uh, the ideas that have been communicated. Is it okay if I talk for five, ten minutes on what the uh, issues that have been communicated? Yes, absolutely. We'll have a debate later. So we will be able to discuss things later. Great. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, for the congratulations. So the uh, the, the chair of Casablanca Casablanca Smart City has an 
E3U and a number of projects that were selected in 2015 to be part of a group of five cities around the world uh, within the framework of a candidacy organized by the World uh, Scientific Society E3U. Now regarding Smart Cities project, digital transformation can increase the resilience and sustainability of cities in various different aspects. First of all, the quality of the air with all the sensors that can be placed around the city and give information on air quality. Education is essential and we've seen during the COVID crisis how digital transformation uh, was able to allow the university year to go ahead in universities around the world. Health as well, transport. The interoperability of different transport systems to avoid traffic jams that lead to a lot of pollution in order to streamline the traffic. So an integrated information system could improve interoperability and there's also the aspect of energy so with renewable energies if we have a digital layer then there can be an optimum distribution so that it's a, there's a, a smart management uh, through smart grids and that can significantly decrease uh, electricity consumption and allows for the use of clean energies. So a couple of work, words on Casablanca. Casablanca is a large city. If you, it's about uh, 6 million inhabitants, including its outskirts. And it's difficult to manage. I've always said that uh, when a city is difficult to manage, you need to use the concept of a smart city. Because that helps you improve the city's services and to have interoperability between services. Now, a couple of words before moving on. The city of Casablanca in 2015 created a new concept, which is that of frugal and social cities. So, smart, frugal and social cities. Now, in a smart city, you could say that you need a lot of means for all of these sensors, and but we can use uh, smartphones as an existing infrastructure that with citizen participation. So the Casablanca project puts citizens at the heart of the digital transformation. It's the citizen who's the main actor in this digital transformation by making digitalization their own. And so there are these uh, quick uh, wins and, uh, in these projects where the, the smart city project becomes inclusive. Now amongst priority services where the concept is applied, well firstly there's education. Education is essential. We've set up a project called uh, IDUA for smart cities which is in the outskirts of Casablanca and that allows children in the outskirts, you can't go to the school, to be able to go to school online or through a hybrid uh, method. And uh, the internet is also an excellent resource for learning. And so I think that digitalization is essential for improving access to education and improving the quality of education. One thing that's also important in uh, in relation to Casablanca, is mobility. Casablanca has got a lot of uh, traffic. We've tried to create an ecosystem. And now, we have a whole ecosystem of startups that make it a smart city and where they master technology. Now we need a governance that can help us to develop a smart city project. Now, there's also the issue of how cities can contribute to 
promoting a smart model where you need to start with governance. And so the two key points which I always talk about is uh, governance and citizen engagement. Now for a governance you need a strategic uh, master urban plan. And if you don't have that, if you don't have this wide view with a, a, a digital scheme, we ask the city to, to ensure that all areas of the city can be connected. And that's really a starting point. Now, in the pandemic, when we digitalized the supply, there were students who couldn't go to the, uh, access the services because they didn't have a laptop. They couldn't pay for the connection. So the inclusive aspect is essential. So cities need to start with a digital vision and define it well. The second thing that's important is citizen involvement. Without it being appropriated by the citizens, the smart city won't benefit citizens. It will be a 2.0 uh, city, uh, or and then you, but you then need to move on to 3.0, and then before you can get to 4.0, which is uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Now, regarding risks, there's the digital fracture I spoke about, and security is a problem because there's, there's the risk of uh, cyber attacks. So we need the it needs to be a sovereign system. We need to have a sovereign approach so that the data remain in the city, in the country, because there's a problem of dependence, which is. Uh, is significant because there are vulnerabilities in smart cities. Now, I talked about the infrastructure as a in terms of a smart urban plan. Now, financing. Now, if you want to have a lot of money to uh, for a smart city, you're not going to get it. You need to have a distributed approach. based on the interests of citizens, needs to be a public-private partnership. And that's what you, the four P, public-private-people partnership. Now, uh, the four Ps. Now, there's, I'll give another example, and that is the university model, the connected university model, every university, uh, establish its own budget, use its own budget to, have, to establish an online teaching system. And all the universities around Morocco were connected in this way. And for this to be sustainable, um, and there's not just sustainable development, but also in terms of there's legislative sustainability. We need to establish laws and regulations now, if we have laws that, oppose, that mean that every uh, transaction, every market, every call for, uh, for proposals around the city integrates the smart aspect, so by producing uh, open data that can be verified, then that would be a, a great step. What we need to do in the city is to, is to create a city stop. So that's a, a sort of digital warehouse where all of the data of the city is integrated into an integrated system. It's a sort of digital warehouse and that collects data, analyzes them and then redistributes them uh, to the relevant services. Now I don't want to take up too much time but uh, I know a lot of very interesting cities. I visited Spain uh, and I've worked a lot with Barcelona. <coughs> and we were accompanied with by Barcelona at the beginning when we were implementing the uh, uh, Smart City Expo in Casablanca. And this was mutually beneficial experience. In the north it was focused on digital and in the south we were more focused on citizens. And so this was a three, four year experience and this allowed us to adopt this 
citizen model where the citizen is the center of the digital transformation. I really like the work that's been done in Madrid, especially it has a very scientific approach. There's a lot of training. There were first international uh, training that was uh, developed around the world. That was the master city uh, uh, science of the uh, Polytechnic University of Madrid and uh, I'd like to congratulate them for that. And so they're not just making this up, they go along. This is a very scientific approach they have in Madrid and I, I think that's uh, wonderful. Montpellier in France is a very interesting uh, city as well because there's urban innovation taking place. There are links throughout the city in the neighborhood so that people can meet, innovate. So the urban innovation aspect is very important. And I'd like to finish with a city that I find very interesting. It's a very large city and that's Istanbul with the metropolitan aspect. Now these are very large cities. Uh, Casablanca is not a huge city but it's a large city and it's growing. But if you think of the, the city as a whole and its environment, and this, this is something I learned from in the benchmarking in Dubai, this aspect is very interesting, and that is multi service. So you can have a multipolar economic situation to ensure that it's sustainable. If there's any sector that fails, then other sectors will be there. So the multipolarity is very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. So after this description of the Casablanca experience, which is very interesting, we're now going to go to another city, another country, uh, and again the floor to Mr. Dawode, President of Tunisian Smart Cities. Yes, I'd like to start by congratulating uh, Yes, so first of all I'd like to congratulate Madame Hawat for her recent uh, nomination. Morocco has always been present in the conference in Tunisia and we've invited Morocco and she's very active in these areas and what she said is very interesting because we need to have another way of thinking about uh, smart cities in Tunisia. So I'm a, a chair of the Tunisian Smart Cities Organization, which has made the smart city in Tunisia, or the issue of intel a smart, resilient, uh, sustainable cities, it's made it a national program. So civil society has taken on this program and turned it into a national program. It's not the state that has taken this, it's civil society in Tunisia that has done so through a, uh, a reflection on the Mediterranean and tu Tunisian cities uh, of tomorrow. And they've done that since 2009. And in 2017, we started the Smart City Programme. And now we're managing uh, an ecosystem, and ecosystems are very important. The ecosystem is what we're managing. And in 2020, we're going to start a digital platform for managing this ecosystem. The, there's about 260 actors across the ecosystem. Uh, 74 uh, associations, uh, about 10 multinationals, 10 uh, universities, and so all of these people know what smart cities are. They know what uh, sustainable cities are. So we're going to be able to construct it with them to implement what we call the smart city perimeters and uh, smart city initiatives. What Madame Abad was saying a moment ago is one one aspect amongst 14 cities, uh, uh, it's number 11. It's the digitalization aspect. Now, we, as urban planners and architects, we, that's how we focus it. Not as integrators. We're not telecom integrators. The technology for us is one way among others that we purchase to facilitate citizens' lives. We don't create smart cities on technology. It's a tool, as Madame uh, Awad said correctly, that allows us to get quick results. And, uh, but in our countries, uh, there are basic problems in cities. The problems of traffic, problems of, of 
of urban planning. And that's why, as urban planners, we've decided to take this uh, program right from the, the beginning with a strategic view, with master plans and uh, uh, with infrastructure, digital uh, infrastructure, uh, with the SMEs. Now, the issue we're talking about today is digital transformation and urban development, sustainable urban development. And we think there are three main challenges here. Social challenges, urban challenges, and economic challenges, which I'm going to finish my speech on. So social challenges, and maybe I'm going to shock you, but we're all talking about digitalization. Nine official speeches on 10 are about that subject. Digitalization, digital transformation. But we feel that we've all been through this COVID crisis. And we're here to learn lessons from our COVID. So, Tomorrow, if we're all connected, interconnected, will we be uh, safe from a digital uh, crisis, a digital pandemic? Would we be able to move around? Would we be able to eat and drink? Would we be able to get healthcare if there's a digital pandemic? Because every day we're completely dependent on connectivity. That's a good question. Now, governments and states, will they be sovereign enough? Uh, she talked about data, but uh, once data is collected, it's local, it's used locally. Uh, um, can it be stored locally? What new role can states have in order to uh, maintain uh, citizen interest? Because what I wrote here is that uh, states will they be sovereign enough to not have to worry? Now, I'm sorry, but I, I think I can say that. So that's, uh, that's why I'm also talking about the real role of the state, which is to preserve citizen interests, the interests of populations. So what new role will the local government have? Now, what leads us to the urban challenge? You know, The idea of ownership of digital uh, infrastructure is important. City, urbanism, digitalization, the digital infrastructures in the city, who will own them in the future? Will it be the city, you in Madrid? Do you own the operators and the telecoms and the, the, the digital infrastructures? Now, do you give a hand to these uh, stakeholders to uh, to own these uh, infrastructures? Now, the sovereignty of local data, uh, Madam Awat uh, mentioned, it's very important to be able to safeguard your data so that you can collect it, uh, manage it, and uh, and work with it later, with the situation of the citizen in mind. Now, the city of the future, the smart city of the future, is able to control its data so that if any problems arise, uh, you can act quickly. So in the smart city program, and in the case of Tunisia, we're talking about points three and four, which are the superposition of the programmatic master plan with digital infrastructures that are required in order to govern the city. That's really important. Now I'm going to talk about a case which is not classic urban planning. There are, we're creating green data cities nowadays. There aren't that many around the world. In Africa, there might be five or six. There will be... Marseille is a data city now. A green data city, I'm not sure. Barcelona is trying to be one through this, uh, the various different networks. But uh, now what is a, a data city? It's a, a city that uh, receives a lot of underwater cables and on its territory, 
it creates a set of data centers that are cr created to a, a connectivity hub, which are connect interconnected through uh, cables. Now, not all cities in the world can have that status. So we, we've got uh, a, a, a version for 2050, and then Tunisia wants to have a data city in, in, in Tunisia. And that can also can use uh, the installations of the military base that we have there. So there's uh, the underground works that uh, are huge and so this can be hyper uh, secure and that will be a sort of, will be able to house data from around the world. Now this is related to the city and, uh, but it's something specific there that we can come back to later. Now finally, uh, economic challenges. Yesterday we talked about economic inclusion and the emergence of issues such as the quarter hour or half hour city. These are, these are important concepts. And that's important for the economic challenges of the city to create this transition. And now, as I was saying yesterday, you need projects for proximity when we're talking about cities. Projects at different levels of impact, local, regional, national, and even Mediterranean. And our resources, well, we've got a, a, PPP, a local PPP with three criteria. The usefulness of projects, bankability of projects, and the fact that they are feasible straight away. So we start with small PPP projects that are useful and with, uh, with uh, trustworthy rules and with a direct impact on, on citizens' life, education, food, well-being, transport. Now I'm just going to finish with this uh, financing mechanism. Now the PPP projects can be small projects with a local impact which resolve a local problem and affects the citizens straight away. It could be a million euro project or it could be a project of 500 euros. Now we can start with small projects with private money and we can use that to change the, the, the area. It could be the Kiron diaspora. They can invest in small projects, uh, these pipeline projects, and things that we've done with the, uh, in the Tunisian uh, Strategic Institute and we've been working with them for a while to, uh, to create our strategy for the city of Timor. And then there's the economic model. It needs to be city and connectivity. Now we're trying to develop a link with the ownership of uh, digital infrastructures and the tax on operators that can allow the city and local uh, authorities to increase their uh, funds according to the number of people connected on the territory and also to ensure that connectivity also becomes a fundamental right such as the access to water and electricity. So these are things I wanted to summarise. I didn't take an hour and a half to talk about the, the whole project but now I'd like to give the, the floor to, to the next speaker and we can talk about that later. Thank you. Merci, merci. Thank you very much for this explanation. So we will have, I can see that we will have like uh, uh, maybe controversial items, but it is very useful for the debate. I give the floor to Victoria Jimenez, who is responsible for the uh, for the urban development in Union for the Mediterranean. Try to be back to normal. And it was a glad surprise for me to see that Cities One was one of the topics that was going to be covered in, in this event because that is not always uh, what happens, let's say. Let me start by saying that I recently visited, uh, I had the opportunity to visit Mazdar City Mazdar City is a smart city located in Abu Dhabi. It's a smart city. It was drafted and conceived by 
a well-known British architect, Sir Norman Foster, back in 2006. Uh, and it was presented then as the city was, that was going to change the way in, in which cities were conceived until now, and it was going to solve all our problems uh, in the future. Uh, I visited the city in 2019, just before the lockdown, and what I saw there, well, they had built just a piece of the city. Uh, there was no one living there, there was no tourists there, and at the end of the day, it was basically a ghost city. So even, even though they, 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 have, they have the best architect, one of the best architects, they have all the support of the, the Emirati government, all the access to all the Emirati funds, uh, they have the support of the MIT, and, but still, that was a, a ghost city. So the reflection was that perhaps cities are much more complex than that. At, at the end of the day, you need layers of hist history, you need uh, complexity, you, you need mixticity, you need the unplanned, uh, and that's not that easy to achieve, let's say. And that's why it, it has been very interesting to hear about the experiences of uh, Morocco and, and Tunisia that perhaps are less ambitious but more real, let's say. Uh, I, I, I was uh, not uh, aware of those, well, I have heard about the Tunisian Smart Cities uh, program, but I, well, I, I don't know, I don't know the program in, in depth, so it has, been, uh, it, it, it has been good to have the opportunity to meet you here. Uh, I had other examples in my radar, let's say. One is the Senata Urban Project in Morocco, which is a project that was uh, financed by the EIB, partly financed by the EIB and the French Development Agency back in 2013. And uh, Senata is a new smart city that they are proposing near Casablanca to decongest the city. I don't know in which stage the project is now. Uh, perhaps the, <coughs> the minister could uh, brief us about that late, later. Um, then there's another, another exercise of a smart city, which is Noor Smart City. And it's a neighborhood of the new administrative capital that they are building in Egypt, uh, 45 kilometers far from Cairo. They are building a new city, and then one part of the city is this smart city exercise, let's say, that <coughs> reminds me a bit to Mazar City. And then more, uh, more nearer to the UFM ecosystem, let's say, there's a project that we label back in 2017. Uh, in Nice, there's what they call Smart City Innovation Center, is, uh, they, where they gather together private, private sector, <coughs> academia, and public authorities to brainstorm together and propose a smart urban solution. And what they proposed was to replicate this, this center, Smart City Innovation Center, in three Mediterranean territories in Alexandria in Egypt, in Fez in Morocco, and in Tunis, in Tunisia. So we labeled the project in 2017, but the thing is that we have not been that focused on smart cities as a such since then. Uh, we, we have been promoting resource efficient cities, energy efficient cities, and, um, and uh, well, that's something that we, that we have in common with the resilience. It is something that we have in common with the concept of a smart city, but our approach has been slightly different. Uh, so, what's our approach? Well, first, we, we do not tend to see cities as a topic in this kind of regional forums because urban, well, yes, Yes, cities, but not urban, urban development or housing, because urban development or housing tends to be seen as a national issue. Even at the, the European Commission, uh, it's like that. Uh, they, uh, housing and urban 
are national policies. The, then there's urban transport or energy or other angles that interfere in that, but the, the policy as a whole tends to be seen as a national domain. So it's obvious for everybody that trade has a regional component, that transport has a regional component, that uh, the sea management has a regional component, which is obvious, but not urban planning. Uh, but the fact is that, well, one year ago, the MEDEC report was published. The MEDEC report is a report drafted by a network of Mediterranean experts on climate change, and that report was highlighting that the Mediterranean region was one of the regions that was going to be more hit by the effects of climate change. And those effects of climate change were going to be translated, or are already being translated into uh, more heavy range and flash floods or, or drought, droughts or difficulties in the access to freshwater resources. And the thing is that all those effects have no boundaries. If, it's, if there are um, flash floods in Morocco, there will probably be flash floods in Spain. If the temperature increases in Palestine, the temperature will increase in, uh, in Israel or if the sea level rises in Italy, it will rise as well in Slovenia. There are no boundaries for that. And cities have a lot to say to that. Climate change is a regional challenge, and 70% of the global greenhouse gas emissions comes from cities. 40% 40, 40 of them directly from buildings. So the way in which we plan the cities and the way in which we build our housing in the future will have a huge impact at regional level for everybody in the region. Uh, and we have an opportunity here because we, we are having these increases of population. Cairo will double his population by 2050. So if we do things right now and if we support all the countries to do things right now, that will be for the benefit of everybody. So with that objective in mind, what we have been working on at the UFM has been in the uh, UFM strategic action plan on sustainable urban development. It's an action plan that was drafted with the support of the Technical University of Delft uh, that was endorsed by member states recently, back in this last July, and that now we plan to put into action with the support of uh, everybody. The idea is that the plan could serve as an umbrella for different activities to be implemented in the region. The action plan focus, focuses on different aspects, such as uh, well, legislation and planning, uh, city development strategies, the role that the schools of architecture can play. If we have better architects, we will have better cities, probably. Heritage as an asset for urban development, data gathering as a base for evidence-based policies, or the impact of climate change in, in port <coughs> cities. Uh, and the final aim, the final objective of all the activities that, uh, that are planned and that are envisaged then uh, is to, at the end of the day, identify good projects, good urban projects in the region to be, to be implemented. And we count with the active participation of uh, everybody to do that. That's it. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Victoria, and for all the information about your action plan. I think it's really useful for us to have it. And um, don't um, I, so the last uh, no the speaker is going to be uh, Fernando Herrero, uh, the director general for innovation of the of Madrid. So you have the floor. Good morning. Uh, <coughs> Bonjour, euh, je ne parle rien français, mais mon anglais c'est terrible. So. I'm not going to speak in French, but my English is not very good. We are in Madrid. Um, I want to, to say several ideas. Um, first of all, the first idea is, I think it's very common, is the, the technology, uh, it's good for the society, so it's good for the cities. 
And 20 years ago, more or less, uh, we start to, to work in an idea, the um, digital cities. Maybe uh, some of, of, of you uh, remember that idea, the digital cities, that are cit cities where the technology, especially the digital technology, uh, are introduced not only in the administration, but also in the people. Uh, in, in that moment, internet was born, in, uh, was uh, growing up, and um, every, every, every people uh, uh, think that that, uh, the, that technology uh, can change our lives. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, or 10 or 20 years ago, we changed the idea uh, instead of uh, use the word uh, uh, digital cities, we start to work uh, to, to, to use the, the name of uh, smart cities. Uh, the, the main idea was the same. It's the technology can change the city, can help us to, to, to make a better world, a better city. Um, but um, uh, smart cities, um, uh, including more that not only technology but also the sustainability, the efficiency, uh, especially the energy efficiency, a, a lot of things. Um, I don't want to, to, to insist in the idea that the technology can help the cities, of course. Uh, maybe uh, in order to, to introduce one, one, one idea in that subject is that uh, here in Spain, uh, we have one uh, club, one, one group of cities, uh, in order to interchange good practices. Uh, this group was, uh, was named um, uh, RECI, uh, Red Española en Ciudades Inteligentes. And uh, that uh, group of, of cities helped us a lot to interchange good practices in order to develop the, the best practices uh, in smart cities. Well, uh, 20 years ago, now uh, in 2021, uh, what is different? What can I uh, say you in order to, to give new ideas or new information about the, the smart cities? I want to explain you one, one different thing. And is uh, the technology, of course, has changed the cities. Uh, in Madrid, there is a lot of uh, examples for example, the, the traffic control, uh, for example, the, the energy of the city, uh, for example, the, the communication between the, the administration and the, and the people uh, is more efficiently with the technology, of course. But what is different? Um, um, what is different from 20 years ago, not so much? In my opinion, the technology has changed one, one thing. And this, the knowledge now is not concentrated in only a few cities. Uh, last century, if you want to know, uh, if, if you want to, to learn technology, want to know the, the best practices, you have to go to not, not a lot of cities. Uh, in, only in, in a few countries, in a few universities, you have the knowledge. You have the possibility to develop technology to develop uh, uh, best practices. But uh, now, 20 years ago, uh, there are a lot of countries, a lot of cities where you can uh, get the, the technology, you can get the knowledge of, 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 the, of the society. Uh, that is the reason why uh, 20 years ago, all of the big enterprises was born in the United States or maybe in Europe, not so much, but now uh, is it possible to develop a good enterprise, a good startup, not only in the United States, not only in Europe, but in all of the world? Uh, in my opinion, this is very important uh, to, to, to have a, a vision of, of what kind of city I, I want to, to develop. Because um, uh, the, the, the world is always competitive, of course. So now, uh, the city, one city like Madrid or, or, uh, or, or any kind of big city, uh, his competitors 
is, are not only in Spain or only in Europe or only in the United States, but in all the world. And this changed the things because uh, you can uh, connect the cities, uh, not only in your country, but in all the world. You can uh, develop the cities with all of the technology that the, the, the humanity, that, that the, the society has, um, not only in, in several, in, in a few countries, but in all the world. That is very important. Uh, we, we detect this uh, in, in the beginning because in Asia, in, 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 uh, in, the, in the 21st century, we start to develop to, uh, big cities with a high technology. But in maybe in 10 years or 20 years, not so much, that technology uh, was standard in all the world. So we have to look at all the cities in the world, not only the, the main cities now. That, that changed the, the idea of what is a city. Uh, the, the second idea is that um, in last century, uh, when, we want, when we want to develop a city, uh, we are the, the, the administration and we make a plan, a very big plan of the city, like urban plan. But now, uh, in my opinion, the cities were, was developed not only for the administration, but also for the people, especially for the entrepreneur people, the startups, the, the enterprises, all of them. Uh, maybe we can talk, we can change the idea of a, a smart city, and, and we must start to talk about a startup city, a, a city developed for the citizens, for the startups. One example, uh, when last year uh, the, the, the COVID came here, and, um, suddenly in, 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 in a few days, uh, suddenly all of our society changed. Uh, all of the Spanish people, at least, and maybe in all the world, we have to get into our homes or houses and we cannot move. And who was the first to, to start to work to help the other people? Not the administration. The administration was blocked. That's in, in, not only in Spain, but in all the world. The first to, to do things to help the other people was the people and especially the startups. Examples here in Madrid, uh, I, we detect startups who uh, make a network, a net. Uh, a network of people with uh, th th 3D printers at home and they start to develop uh, some gadgets and some things that the hospital needs. Was the startups the first to make uh, mobile apps in order to connect people to help one to others? Uh, that is the idea of uh, a startup city, a very a city who changed very, very fast. A city that when suddenly uh, something happens, they can uh, react very quickly. A traditional city with a very big administration uh, is not able to, to react very, very quickly for the change. And I have uh, talking about one example very extremely, very a COVID, a, a, a pandemic, but uh, the future, uh, the things can, we, uh, the things will change very quickly, because the, the technology and the society uh, is different from the another centuries. Now the, the things will will change very very quickly. Uh, now we are, for example, uh, we are detecting that uh, in, including the the, the politicians, uh, the governments, and all of that things. Are, uh, are changing very, in, in very quickly, and, and maybe the society cannot react very, uh, as, at, at that speed. And so that is the reason that we have to prepare the, the cities that uh, not only the government, not only the administration, uh, has the one to, to design the city, but also we must include in the startups, the people, the entrepreneur people, in order to make cities 
uh, very resilient, very, uh, very technological also. And maybe that in that way, we can uh, be, uh, we can develop a competitive city, not only in the countries with a high technology, but in all the countries in the world. Uh, I mean, uh, nowadays, if, if you are a city in the United States, for example, or in North of Europe, if, traditionally you have all of the technology, you can develop the city, but not only the city, you can develop startups and, and enterprise uh, with high technology. But now, if you are in, in countries far away from Europe, far away, far away from the north of the United, of the United States, you can uh, make cities with, uh, with technology. We can make cities with the people, can create startups, uh, competitive in all the world, can develop uh, his technology to the other world, and, and that made, I think, a, a new world, a, a different kind of world. Uh, not only the people, uh, the, the cities are connected, uh, one city with another, only because they, are, they live in the same country, they are in the same country, but the, the cities uh, can be connected uh, only because they have the same kind of people, the people with, with, uh, with, with, uh, with a very, uh, I don't know how to explain, uh, people who want to do a lot of things, uh, people <coughs> who, who has technology to develop uh, new things. And maybe that, that is the idea why here in Madrid uh, we have a plan for, for a smart city, of course, uh, in that plan including the, the traffic, the energy, of course, the, the, the buildings, all of the traditional things of a smart city. But also we are including the startups, we are including the people, the people who want to create, want to create uh, uh, new things. Because um, if, if you uh, help that people, uh, the, the talent uh, 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 makes the, the talent of the people of other kind of part of the world come to this city. Because uh, you have to give uh, facilities, you have to give uh, opportunities to the people to come here. Because the, 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 maybe the most important thing in the, in the future will be the, the, the people with talent, the, the people with capacity, with knowledge. Uh, here we have in Spain one, one very interesting example that uh, some of, of, the, of the most famous YouTubers uh, moved from, from the city of, uh, to Spain to another city in another country because uh, the, the, the other country gave them uh, opportunities that they are not here. Maybe some people say, oh, well, that the problem of taxes, that is the problem of paying a lot of money. Yes, but uh, that is a good example of uh, the world is very open. It's not possible to close the people. It's not possible to close the talent in, in one city or in one country. So if you want to develop the cities of the future, you need that kind of people because uh, the, the, the knowledge is uh, is spread in all the world, and the most important thing in your city is, of course, the, the infrastructure, but also the people, the people with, with talent. Uh, that is my idea. Thanks a lot, Fernando. Um, donc, um, je passe la parole maintenant au dernier intervenant. Monsieur Oriol Barba, director of MedCities. Thank you very much. Gracias, uh, yeah, I am Ed and the UFM Secretariat for inviting me. Can you hear me well? Yes. It's Casa Arabe. Casa Arabe. Casa Arabe is in Barcelona and I, I just mixed. <laughs> Sorry for that. Sorry for that. Um, thank you very much. I appear in the program as first reactions. So I assume there will be like second reactions and third reactions. Uh, what I just explained is that the program has slightly changed. Okay. So actually you are going to intervene and then we are all going to open the debate. Excellent. Well, I'll try to focus my intervention on, 
on reacting to the previous uh, participation. First of that, uh, let me introduce very briefly MedCities. MedCities is the network of uh, municipalities in the Mediterranean. We gathered together 63 uh, municipalities and unions of municipalities from 15 different countries. It was created in 1991 in, in, in Barcelona. And it works essentially on, on five fields, uh, but in all of them with the ultimate goal to reinforce the capacities of local authorities in managing the city. Those five uh, fields are city development strategies, uh, urban services, environment and biodiversity, social cohesion and economic development. Um, we implement um, around 15 projects in the region uh, with our members with the objective of uh, strengthening the capacity of local authorities in managing their daily challenges, right? Um, I would group the arguments that were explained this morning in, in, three, in three main blocks, I would say. The, the first one is linked to, to technology and the link between technology and accessibility that was explained by Mrs. Hayar and Mr. Dawabi. Uh, technology grants access and the lack of technology can also um, create inequalities. So there's a, a permanent link between uh, technology and e equality or inequality. So technology is not neutral and it has an effect on how societies and on how cities are structured. I think that this idea was, was shared at least by the first two, two speakers. Linked to that, uh, there's the question of, of governance. Um, technology, you both said it is an instrument. So it, it, technology is uh, used to achieve uh, uh, certain goals, right? And it is necessary to create a governance system in order to guarantee that this technology uh, fulfills the goals that we intend to achieve, whatever they are. I mean, they can be multiple, but there's a governance system linked to technology. And this is, in my opinion, very interesting and very important because um, when we speak about cities, and now we are so used to talk about uh, smart cities and the role of cities, and as uh, Victoria Jimenez was saying, the question of cities, but we never ask, what do we mean when we say cities? Are we talking about uh, the local authorities that uh, run the city? Are we talking about uh, startups, as Mr. Herrero was saying? Are we talking about civil society? Are we talking about all of them at the same time? Because at the end of the day, that would be crucial in order to understand what are the dynamics uh, under the, the, the question of cities in the region, right? Um, we, as a network of local authorities, uh, sometimes perceive or we feel that uh, sometimes we're doing a lot of uh, urban policy or city policy uh, of the city, for the city, but without the city. No? And I'm so glad that here we have Mr. Herrera with us, a representative from the City uh, Council of Madrid, because sometimes we discuss a lot about cities without having the city governments uh, playing a role in that sense. No? Because the role of uh, local authorities in the region cannot be taken for granted. Uh, uh, if we have a look on the situation of local authorities in the region, it's rather, let's say, weak and unstable. We had, for example, local elections uh, last month in Morocco with a quite successful uh, uh, participation rate. This is good news. Uh, we have also now in Tunisia a new government and the role of cities and local authorities is still a bit unclear, so let, let's see where we go. In Algeria we have local elections next month. Uh, without going to the south, even here in Spain, uh, cities... Et en Espagne, il y a eu des restrictions pendant la crise économique et la capacité de gestion. Donc, quand nous parlons de, de la gouvernance et des de villes, le, les autorités locales ont un, un, un rôle crucial. This is a question that is for us very important to, to underline, that um, local authorities need to find their opportunities to participate in this debate. And the capacity, and this links with the third issue I would like to outline, to uh, 
interact among them. And I link it with the presentation of Mr. Herrero here. Uh, the capacity to learn, the capacity to network together. Uh, this is very important when we speak about city learning again uh, maybe there is not enough uh, discussion on how cities learn, who learns in a city, who has to learn. We're talking about technical stuff, political stuff, what are the best mechanisms to, to learn. Uh, we participate in a lot of European uh, projects and the classical output of a European project is to create a network of whatever is the topic uh, of the city and to create a, a best practices catalog of whatever is the topic of the project, okay? But then maybe we do not think enough on how these networks are maintained, on how this knowledge is made available. Creating a best practices catalog is not a guarantee that that knowledge is made available for the ones that have to have access to this knowledge. So I think it is important that we, uh, we, we dedicate uh, a second to understand how the city's uh, access to knowledge and who has to access to that knowledge and by what means. Because at the end of the day, the capacity of cities uh, to generate these informal or formal networks and to acknowledge and to understand the process that will lead to further development is something that is not maybe uh, developed enough. Uh, I found very interesting the question of um, uh, dissemination of knowledge that Mr. Herrero was pointing out. The knowledge is no longer concentrated, so it's not in a one place that we can go there and access to it uh, easily. And in that sense, the need to create networks and to create the spaces to access to that knowledge and make it available is something that is not, is not very, very obvious. I would like to finish by two points. The first one uh, links to the capacity of Mediterranean local authorities to participate uh, actually in international dynamics and international opportunities. Uh, as you know, there are several um, programs that uh, are theoretically available for cities to participate and to generate in this kind of dynamics and exchanges. But if we have a look on how local authorities are participating in those programs, and I'm thinking about uh, neighborhood programs or interreg programs or Europe 8 at the time programs as well, we see that very few local authorities uh, especially in the southern Mediterranean countries, actually participate in those, in those programs, even if they are eligible. And then if we have a look and if we scratch a bit to see what's the cause, uh, is because uh, the difficulty they have to access to those funds, to prepare uh, projects, to manage those funds is very, very, very limited. No? If, we, if I can explain some examples of situations that happened to us in Met Cities during the last week, uh, we had to face situations of uh, cities that are members of one project and then they cannot pay the travel even if they are in a project that has been approved and they have a budget for it, but for internal mechanisms they don't have the capacity to implement the projects by which they have been selected. Uh, they cannot uh, issue tenders or terms of reference to hire the projects or the, the, the experts that uh, appear in a grant application form that has been approved. So if we narrow it down and if we see the detail and the capacity that local authorities have to participate in, that, in those dynamics is very, 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 very limited. So uh, this is uh, a, a certain claim that we need to make explicit efforts to uh, get local authorities on board on this debate in order to guarantee the equ equity somehow. It's no, not enough to open the door to them, but they need extra support in order to be able to participate in these debates because by their own nature, it's not obvious that they can, they can do so. Finally, an opportunity we have ahead. I think that the action plan that uh, on urban development that the youth FM just approved uh, before the summer is an opportunity for everybody. Uh, it's an action plan that uh, is conceived uh, uh, in a sense of gathering together the different actors working in that, in that sense. And I think it is important by all actors to have a common roadmap. I think that this roadmap uh, is an opportunity for everybody and that uh, you can probably 
uh, gather better than anyone else the different actors in order to achieve the challenges that, that we have ahead. That is all. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for this fantastic sum up of uh, and, uh, and uh, compilation of the ideas. I think it was very clear and helped us to have a more structural idea of what we heard today. We still have uh, 10 minutes, I think, before the, um, the, the clôture, no? the, last, the, the, the last seance, donc uh, s'il y a... We have 10 minutes before the, end, the closing, uh, so have you got any questions or reactions? Now's the time. A lot of questions have been asked. Perhaps there are some reactions. Maybe it was clear enough then, yes. Yes. Uh, yes, I have two things I'd like to say in relation to Mr. Oriol, who was talking about this issue of dissemination of knowledge and uh, Now, in relation to the other program, point 15, sorry, 14 of the Tunisian Part Smart Cities uh, about eligibility talks about creating new jobs created related to governance in areas that want to be smart and, uh, um, and sustainable. So we have smart city managers and uh, sustainability managers uh, that we're going to be trained uh, with. Uh, we've prepared an academic program, a master classes, and a classical training program on what a smart city manager is, what a data manager is. And these are uh, jobs that are going to allow us to organize the smart city supply in a city and above all to organize public purchasing. Because there's a lot of charlatans in, the, in this, this world. Uh, Every day municipalities are receiving people to sell anything to them, things useful, things that aren't useful. So uh, a smart city manager who has a cross-cutting knowledge, who knows, they may not be super experts, but they know how, what an energy bid is. They know what a, an, an, an urban planning uh, bid is. You know how to, to work with a tender related to um, local tax services. Now, all of these aspects, you need uh, a man or a woman in a local authority who's able to speak about all these issues and above all, to be able to help the city to purchase and to organize tenders. So the people need to be trained for that, and we need capacity building on that. Now, Victoria talked about examples of smart cities. We don't have a magic wand. We can't just wave a wand and say, look, Tunisia, uh, Rabat are smart cities. No, we talk about smart city perimeters. Now, fortunately, we have regulations that allow us to do that. There are the, these, these the limits of the periphery. We can start with what we already have in, in our uh, uh, legal administrative arsenal to be able to uh, create the, uh, this. Now, one for five years, another for another five years, and eventually our children, 30, 40 years, will have a city that has been built on itself. We're not there to destroy agricultural lands to create uh, more cities. No, we'll, that will happen sometimes, but the idea is how, through urban renewal programs, we can create these urban city, smart city perimeters that will have a specific legal status to encourage public and private uh, investments, so tax uh, incentives, uh, development incentives, a certain and uh, certain advantages to create these urban plans so that the city can become increasingly smart 
and increasingly sustainable and resilient and to create a better life for citizens. So that's just to clarify the issue of master city. Of course, it's a very bad example. But, uh, now we're going to be getting a, a advertising, but uh, now you talked about history and of the superposition of history, and a city is not done in a blink of an eye. But, uh, I really hope that it's successful, but it, it is difficult. And I completely agree uh, uh, that it is very difficult. Thank you very much. Any other reactions? There's something I wanted to mention before, and uh, I, I forgot at the end. Uh, I heard once, I cannot confirm the source, that 60% of the offices in Mediterranean local authorities in Southern Mediterranean, they don't have a computer. Uh, and it's not because they have a laptop. Uh, so it's very difficult to manage uh, smart cities and to guarantee that governance when uh, uh, the officers, and it's not only that we don't have a data manager on a municipality, you, you, know, you know Tunisia much better than me, but uh, it's not only that we have understaffed uh, local authorities is that uh, those people, even if they have probably the knowledge uh, because they have good education and you know access to, to knowledge, they don't have the, the, the means to, to, to access to technology, even for answering emails. So uh, most of you, when you work with local authorities, you will see that you start receiving emails from work at 7, 8 p.m. at night. That could be because they have a lot of work. This is one reason. But another reason is that they answer those emails when they get home and they can access to their computers. So this is very, very, very important. Um, we need to. It's not a matter now of buying computers and putting computers on the table. I mean, that would not solve the issue. But sometimes we forget uh, crucial aspects that uh, make public authorities, and in this case, local authorities, unable to respond to the enormous challenges they have ahead. Thanks. Um, I have to say, I've lost my glasses, so if there's someone who wants to talk, now is the time. Uh, please uh, raise your hand clearly so that... Uh, no? No reactions here? Okay, well, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to moderate this panel. I, didn't, I wasn't able to add much to what you said because you're the expert, so I'm not uh, an expert. But at any rate, I think this is a very useful discussion. I think there's a lot of uh, subjects that uh, are really important to discuss. Oh, yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I don't have a question, but I didn't want the panelists to make a, to, to misunderstand our silence. They might understand it because we have so much knowledge on this issue, on smart cities, or they might think that it's because we know we haven't understood anything and that we can't react. Now, perhaps it's somewhere between the two. What? I liked to hear um, in all these different interventions is that it made me think about the following. Is there not a need to promote a general culture on the need for smart cities? Because you talked about the lack of computers or the um, lack of internet uh, coverage. You've talked about the need in uh, local and regional government to have people who have this reflex and this intuition uh, regarding uh, smart cities and how to approach it. And the most important thing is that when political decisions are made, that politicians can own this idea and implement it at local, national and regional levels. But uh, beyond all of that, I'd like to thank the panelists because they've really 
clarified something very important for our future. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there's a, we've had very attentive listeners on both sides. So thank you very much. Now, I think I'd like to add to what you've just said that uh, I think we're leaving here with uh, a lot to think about, and, uh, a lot of uh, very interesting uh, ideas that have been expressed, very useful for our work as well. Yes, would you like to um, conclude? Well, I think it's... Uh, what I can say, this idea of 5 plus 5 is an extraordinary idea. It's very interesting because it's going to allow us to pool our experiences now, there are some good examples from the north, but there are also some good experiences from the southern shore. My friend and colleague Bohan, there are other colleagues from Tunisia, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa as well, uh, Tigali and uh, other cities that uh, are well known for their very interesting smart city approaches. And so I think we need to do a twinning, uh, sharing good practices, and we need to go to the fundamental aspects. Now, I'm an engineer, a telecom engineer, and yet I say that the intelligence of smartness is not the digital aspect, it's the human aspect. So how can we move towards this collective intelligence that can own digital so we have a better future for humanity? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. And I think uh, you're identifying something that I think is very important as a conclusion, and that is when we talk about cities, we're talking about people. So we're thinking about how, with this new dynamic that we uh, have to face up to, this digital revolution, the green revolution, climate change, what can we do to be able to live together and to live with this in the cities, in the north and the south? So absolutely, thank you very much. And thanks for your closing remarks. Thank you for your participation. Yes, just for, I'd like to thank the, the ambassador, when you, who's, the point he made about culture of smart cities. just wanted to say that Yes, this issue of culture, how we can have a smart city culture. And the, in the national program of Tunisian smart cities, we have smart city kids program, which is, creates a whole set of training activities with uh, applications for children to, to target schools. And, and we, have, uh, we get children to think about the cities of the, the future. We've started that. We haven't developed a lot of activities yet. We have five or six activities already in schools on this issue of the culture of smart cities. Because we're talking about smart cities here, but in the end, we're not the ones who are going to live in a, a real smart city. It's our, our children. So that's why we try to get them involved. Yeah, just to reassure you that we do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I think this uh, comes back to the messages of what we build together with people and experiences and uh, that's the the virtual aspect and the, the ability to have these discussions so it means that we can have this uh, sharing of experiences so Tunisia, Morocco, Madrid, Barcelona we've uh, ex shared, a lot of, shared a lot of good practices so we're now going to close the session and we're going to move to the final closure of the seminar so I'd like to give you the floor Merci. Au revoir. Au revoir.